So that that was um that was awesome what Devin read. Uh, it was just incredible. And it reminds me of how just how big um how big God is. And sometimes I think the the answer to everything you have is just have a bigger perspective of God. And it doesn't matter what it is. Have a bigger perspective of God. So um, I actually had a uh, I had a whole teaching because uh, Tuesday nights is usually a night of teaching. I had a whole teaching prepared, and and this morning when I walked in here, um, God was like, "Get rid of that, start over." So <laughs> hours wasted. Well, they're not wasted. I'm I'm sure I'll teach the other thing at some point. Um, I've been reading this book, which is incredible, called "The Power of His Presence." It was written in 1969 or something like that. And uh, it's by Graham Truscott. And he kind of talks about uh, the the presence of God, and he parallels that with the Ark of the Covenant, and he parallels that with the Tabernacle of David, and he talks about how that's basically what he believes is, is coming, is a restoration of that. And it's a great book, and um, it kind of gave me a, a thought about where I, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard me, but I've kind of said, and I've heard other people say that I, I believe personally that there's a move of God coming. Um, it's one that is going to be very shocking, uh, very unusual. It's not going to look like the other moves of God have looked. It's going to look different. Um, it's going to look a lot more like the book of Acts and less like what we've kind of experienced. And I say that carefully because I, I, ha- I don't mean any disrespect for the revivals that have come in the past 10, 20 years because um, God used them. But I think recently our view of revival is a little skewed and our view of revival is basically um, a really fiery, incredible speaker who um, moves in signs and wonders and gets everybody excited and you leave there and you're just hyped up and ready for God to do something special. But in actuality, that's really not what revival is. Um, firstly, because revival is not something that you can drum up. Uh, it's not something that you can create or plan or schedule. It's it's a completely sovereign move of God, and it happens when He wants it to happen. Uh, we can pray for it, we can ask for it, and I think those are good things, and we should. Um, however, most of the time, when God starts bringing revival in, the very beginnings of that, it, it's very scary. It looks very scary. It's very hard. It requires a lot of death. It requires people pushing your buttons. It requires you dying every day. It requires you waking up and, and forcing yourself to, to enter into His presence. I know that's not what you want to hear, but that's the reality. Um, and we have lots of biblical examples of that, of exactly what I just uh, said. And one of those examples, this is actually not what I'm teaching about, but this is just, I felt like God kind of impressed to say this. But when you look at um, the day of the Lord in the book of Joel, everyone has a tendency, and there's nothing wrong with that, to skip down to chapter 2, verse uh, 28 and read and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit on all flesh your sons and daughters will prophesy etc um, but that's not going to happen unless chapter 1 and all of chapter 2 happens first no one wants that no one says that no one expects that and when they're confronted with that the, the your initial reaction is this can't be God this has got to be the devil This has got to be my flesh. This has got to be whatever. But the reality is, is there is somewhat of a, not blueprint, but there is a way that God requires uh, the the beginnings of revival in us. Now, I'm not talking about a corporate widespread move of God. That's different. That's not something that I can stand up here and yell loud enough for God to do. That's not something that you can, you know, kneel in your bedroom on rice for eight hours a day in the total blackness and pray a hundred prayers for God to move. That won't do that either. I'm sorry. Um, Going to the right conference at the right time with the right speaker and the right singer at the right moment in the right state uh, when everything goes great in your day, that won't do it either. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of us have tried that and it's kind of, you know, it's that moment where you, you... you just realize, God, what is it that you want? Well, I'll tell you what he wants. Um, it's been the same thing for a long time. And it's a call to re- repentance. It's a call to um, laying down your life. It's a call to asking God to remove 
the things in you that are holding him back. Uh, in Joel chapter 2, verses 12, he says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering. And here is the... Here is the uh, I guess the requirement blow the trumpet in Zion consecrate a fast call a sacred assembly gather the people sanctify the congregation assemble the elders gather the children and the nursing babes let the bridegroom go out from his chamber let the bride from her dressing room let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say spare your people O Lord and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them who would say among the peoples where is their God that I think is the state I know she may not have that oh well she does that's the state of America right now we are a reproach on the gospel the country of the United States of America whatever we are a reproach. Now, there are examples of people that press in. Pastor Frank and Pastor Paris is, is a great example of people that live. You may not know this. I've been fortunate enough to be a part of their life. They live a fasted life. Now, I'm not talking about just food. I know she, I know she would t talk about that, but not just food. It's their whole life is fasted. But overall, the overarching theme of the American church is not that. It is what can God do for you? How can God bless you? Etc. Unfortunately, none of that brings revival. It just brings a lot of happy clubs of people. Um, so the Lord in verse 18, he says, then, okay, so can we all agree that everything I just read in the verses previous in verse 18, when he says, then God is telling you those first things have to happen and then what he's about to say can happen. He says, Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you a grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them, and I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Then, first, blow the trumpet consecrate a fast, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. In Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 10, he says, um, God basically tells Ezekiel, I, we're going to start, we're going to, we're going to start this thing. We're going to usher in the glory of the Lord. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to kill everyone who doesn't have the mark of God on their forehead. Okay. I know that's extreme, but what he says is start at my temple start with the elders at the temple start with in other words us the priests everyone well, you want to say you're a royal priesthood a holy nation we are and it's a requirement on us to be the ones that are asking the lord for a move of god that starts with repentance so um that is all a big side trail but the reality is is it, it fits with what i'm talking about and what we're talking about tonight is the glory of God. The glory of God is the most important thing in the universe. If it was an, uh, an element in the periodic table, there would be none other like it and there would be nothing more rare and more precious. It is the most important thing in the universe. There's nothing more important than the glory of God. Um, I wanted to read a quote from that book, um, which you don't have unfortunately, but it says, we see growing evidence on every side of this glorious revolution, which will break down secretarian isolation and prejudice and sweep away the mass of tradition and dead formality, which has long divided God's people and bogged them down in the emptiness of merely playing church instead of actually meeting the living God. This was written in 1969. Breakdown, secretarian isolation, and prejudice 
and sweep away the mass of tradition and dead formality which has so long divided God's people and bogged them down in emptiness of merely playing church instead of actually meeting the living God. Meeting the living God is the same as seeing the glory of God, bringing glory to God. And again, another chapter, it says, once again, the church will turn the world upside down and shake the foundations of hell. It will be a unified, spirit-filled, and fully functioning organism. Every member in the body shall display before men and angels the very fullness of the risen Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 says that Jesus is the very outshining the effulgence, the fullness, the stamp, the brightness of God the Father. So th so I spent a lot of the time today just trying to figure out what this whole glory of God thing was all about. Because we sing songs like Shekinah glory. Shekinah is not a word that actually even appears in the Bible. It's not something that you hear every day, and it's not something that I think most people re really understand. Um, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So, I mean, it, you can't find a lot in the entomology or studying that particular word. Looking for something on glory sends you down a bunch of rabbit trails. Um, but I was actually surprised by um, a couple of the quotes. Wikipedia um, lists glory as divine glory is an important motif throughout Christian theology where God is regarded as the most glorious being. That, that by the way, means that we are not FYI, since we are created in the image of God, human beings can share or participate in divine glory as image bearers. Like a mirror, the human person reflects God's glory, though imperfectly. Imperfectly. So the, the idea is we're just mirrors. We're image bearers. We, we, you know, we look like God, but we, the glory is not ours. Jonathan Edwards in um, Concerning the End for Which the God Created the World, which you can actually read in uh, one of John Piper's books, says it appears that all that is ever spoken of in the scriptures as an ultimate end of God's works is included in that one phrase, the glory of God. So everything you read in scripture, everything, has one sum. And the summation of all those verses is, glory of God. So glory occur, uh, occurs 402 times in the King James Version. 402 times. It's one of the most widely used um, words in the entire Bible. Glory. Uh, kabod is one of the, the ways that it's used in the Old Testament. Kabod uh, means weight, heaviness, importance, it means something special. If you walk, I'll give you an example. If you were to walk right now, if you were given the opportunity to go visit the Queen of England or something like that, or the, the president, well, the Queen of England or, you know, someone really that, that carries a lot of just history and that, you know, walks around with an entourage and, you know, and you were able to kind of walk through the courts of that person, there's that weighty kind of tenseness that you feel standing in that the presence of something truly important truly truly valuable that's nothing compared to the glory of God it's that weightiness that weightiness that you felt earlier at least I felt it earlier tonight there's still some of it hovering in the air that's just settling there's that kabod that, that weight um, there's another word kabod now that occurs 200 times in the Old Testament. And that word means abundance, riches, honor, splendor, glory, dignity, uh, reputation. There's, God has a reputation. Um, and so I, I really wanted to learn more about this glory. I don't know if you remember a couple weeks ago, I, I said I felt that, you know, the glory was returning. I read Psalm 137 that says, you know, we hung our harps in the willows. We, we wept when we thought of Zion. It was this, this really bad place that the uh, Israelites were in. They had been pulled out of uh, Jerusalem, pulled out of Zion, and brought into captivity. And then Psalm 126 says that, you know, when we saw Zion, when we saw the glory of Zion, we were like those that dream, and there's laughter filled in our mouth. Um, and I, I, there's this thought that I had about 
you know, how many, how many different ways does God kind of describe his glory? There's actually quite a few. We're not going to go through all of them, but we're going to go through a select few. Um, Easton's Bible Dictionary describes that word kabod or duxa in the Greek as abundance, wealth, treasure, honor, glory, dignity of God, of mind, of heart, splendor, brightness, majesty, the glorious moral attributes, the infinite perfections of God, the brightness of the Father's glory, the bliss of heaven. Uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says the fundamental idea of this root seems to be weight, heaviness, and and hence its primary use conveys the idea of some external physical manifestation of dignity, of preeminence, of majesty. The word glory refers to the blaze of light and splendor, which is the essential expression of the holy majesty of Yahweh. This idea of this ancient... uh, unbelievable shining unbelievable brightness just this glorious uh, splendor this majesty that few were able to see and I wanted to expound on that kind of thing that I felt the Lord told me about the glory returning and um, I wanted to give you a little history of times where God's glory actually showed up. Uh, we're, I have a couple of scriptures. You're welcome to turn to them, but they should be on the screen. Uh, Exodus 40, 34, and 35. I'm reading a lot out of the Amplified lately. Um, it takes longer, but it's it's gives you a lot more, I think. Um, then the cloud, the Shekinah, God's visible presence covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud remained upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle first Kings 8 10 13 says when the priests had come out of the holy place the cloud filled the Lord's house so the priests could not stand and minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house Solomon said The Lord said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have surely built you a house of habitation, a settled place for you to dwell in forever. 2 Chronicles 5, 11 through 14 says, And when the priests had come out of the holy place, for all the priests had present present had sanctified themselves, separating themselves from everything that defiles without regard to their divisions. And all the Levites who were singers, and all those of Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, with their sons and kinsmen, arrayed in fine linen, having cymbals, harps, and lyres, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets. So this is a huge processional of musicians and singers, trumpet players, um, and you've got the best of the best. I mean, the best in the world. And when the trumpeters and singers were joined in unison, making one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted their voice and the trumpets and the cymbals and the other instruments for song, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, his mercy and his loving kindnesses endure forever. Then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Second Chronicles 7 says, When Solomon had finished praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the people of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed with their faces upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, his mercy and his loving kindness endures forever. Isaiah 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, in a vision I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the skirts of the train filled the most holy part of the temple. And above him stood seraphim, each had six wings, with two each covered his own face, and with two each covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Ezekiel 43, verse 2 says, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. 
And the vision which I saw was like the vision I had seen when I came to foretell the destruction of the city, like the vision I had seen beside the river Kabar near Babylon. And I fell on my face, and the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. Then the Spirit caught me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And I heard one speaking to me out of the temple, and a man stood by me, and he, the Lord, said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Ezekiel 44, verse 4 says, Then he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. Perfect humility, perfect humility is found in the presence of the glory of the Lord. Absolute perfect humility. There is no such thing as glory of anything else but the glory of God when you're in his presence. Perfect humility is found in the presence of the glory of the Lord. And um, I, it, made, it really kindled something in me. I hope it's kindling something in you. What does the Bible say this glory looks like? If it looks like anything, what does it look like? And if it does look like something, is there any expectation that we could see or experience or feel what they felt? And the answer I got was uh, really interesting because I, I, I didn't expect it. And the answer was basically, most people just don't ask for it. And so there's no reason why I should give it to them. And it was this idea of, you know, my glory is so important to me. It's the most important thing in the universe to me. And I don't share it lightly. And there was a lot of pomp and circumstance that went into the, the Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple. And in Amos 9.11, it says that God is going to restore the tabernacle of David. And I always thought that was interesting because he doesn't say he's going to restore the tabernacle of Moses. He doesn't say he's going to restore the temple of Solomon or Herod's temple. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to restore David's tabernacle. There's, there was no pomp or circumstance there. It was pure worship. It was pure humility. So I, I, went, on, I went on a search. Um, I said this at small group the other night, but... Most of the time, the verses that really hold a lot of weight, like really weighty, that talk about the throne, the presence, the visuals there, most people don't read them because they're surrounded by very scary verses. There's verses about death and destruction and cleansing and getting ready, and then there's a little glimpse of the glory of God, and then he goes back into destruction and hurt and heartbreak and things like that. And Again, I asked the Lord, you should also get into a habit of asking the Lord questions as you read the Bible. Just don't, don't take it for face value. Ask the Lord, God, what are you, what are you saying? What does this mean? What are, you, what are you telling me about this verse? And what he said was, I've hidden it. I've hidden my glory. I've hidden uh, heaven. I've hidden the presence. I've hidden these things in the Bible so that only the truly desperate find it. When my son was on the earth, only the truly desperate received anything from him. In his hometown of Nazareth, they rejected him. And what they said, which I thought was interesting, was they, there was two different accounts. The first, first account, one of the accounts says that they said, do the works that you did in Capernaum, do those here. The other account says that they saw what he did at the feast it was Passover in Jerusalem, and they wanted him to do that there, okay, in Nazareth. They did not want Jesus. They wanted fame. They wanted celebrity. They wanted all of the grandiose things that the title of Jesus came with. In, in essence, they wanted the guy that they heard about, but they didn't really want him. And he said, Luke 5 is a verse that blows my mind to this day. It says you can't put old wine in new wineskins because you'll, it'll burst and you'll ruin both. But you put new wine in new wineskins, you'll preserve them both. You don't put an old, a new piece of cloth on an old garment because it'll shrink and then you'll tear and you'll lose it. And um, he says this really, really interesting phrase at the end where he says, No one who drinks the old wine immediately wants the new. 
for they say the old is better. Luke 5. You drink the old wine, you no longer have a desire for the new. So they didn't want Jesus because Jesus came. He says earlier in Luke 5, he says, uh, you know, I, I didn't come for the righteous. I didn't come for the healthy. I came to heal the sick. That's who I came for. The verse that got them so upset was that he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to preach the gospel, to preach cap, uh, freedom to the captives, to heal the sick. To That's what he said he was here for. They said, well, that's great. The very, next, the very next verse, you can look it up later. The very next verse he says, who is this guy? This is, don't we know his dad? In the original, it actually the word is actually Joey. It's not even Joseph. They say Joey. They, they give his nickname, his Jewish nickname. They don't say Joseph. They say Joey. Isn't this Joey's kid? And then he gives a, an interesting story. And he says, there were many widows during the time of Elisha that were hungry, but he only came to one. And there were many who were filled with leprosy during the time of Naaman, but he only came to Naaman. Both of those people were Gentiles. They were not Jews. So what Jesus was telling them is, there were millions of Jews. I didn't go to any of them. I went to this Gentile, and I fed her. Or, I, or the, her daughter was sick, whatever. And I went to this Gentile, Naaman, and I healed him. And then they wanted to throw him off a cliff. As well they should, because what he was telling them was, you don't really want me. You don't really want what I have. You want a show. You want to be entertained. I'm not here to entertain. I'm heal, here to heal the sick. I'm here for the desperate. And so I felt like the Lord told me, he said, I, I've hidden these verses. They're in plain sight. You read Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, Daniel 7. You read Isaiah 6. You read Revelation 15, Revelation 4, 5, Revelation 21, 22. It's there. It's all there. Exodus 24, 10, and so on. God takes 70 elders, Nahab and Abihu and Aaron and Moses, and God himself has lunch with them. In Genesis, Abraham has lunch with God and two angels. And then God turns around to Abraham and he looks at the angels and God says, I wonder if I should include Abraham in my plans. And he does. Tells Abraham, here's what I'm getting ready to do. I'm getting ready to go blow these cities up. What do you think? Can you imagine that? God, God sharing his plans with a mere person? Unthinkable. But it's all right there. Anyway, so I, I, I got a couple of these together, not a very short version. Ezekiel 126 through 28 says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. And seated above the likeness of a throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man. From what had the appearance of his waist upward, I saw a luster, as it were, glowing metal with the appearance of fire enclosed round about within it. From the appearance of his waist downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. And there was a brightness of a halo round about him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on a day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And what's his response? And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. Perfect humility. Perfect humility. This is a verse, that, it's another one of those verses that's completely passed over. No one ever looks at it. One of the most amazing verses in the entire Bible. And we read it once a year. And it's on cards. And it's a joke. Luke 2, verse 8. There were sheep herders camping in their neighborhood. And they had set watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angel stood among them. And God's glory blazed around them. And they were terrified. And the angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. 
this is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket. Verse 13, this is in the message translation, is incredible. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. Imagine you're a shepherd, you're, on, you're, you're out in the wilderness, and suddenly an angel appears, and this angel is carrying that thick, weighty glory, and you feel that coming off of the angel, and then the angel's joined by millions of angels cascading over the entire countryside, bright, luminous angels dripping with the glory of God, and they're all singing praises to Jesus on earth. Jesus said, I could call at any moment 12, 12 legion of angels at any moment. The way that the math works out is there's 6,000 in a legion. Yet he at any moment could call 72,000 angels. And that's not, he's not bluffing. At any moment, he could have called 72,000 angels just like that. The glory of God. Multitudes of angels cascading the countryside. And they're all of them praising. Every single one of them praising. We read it once a year. And it's on Christmas cards. This verse was always an interesting one. And I really love it. And it's in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. It's really, it really kind of brings out some of the life in, from the Amplified. He says, he is the soul, it's talking about Jesus, he is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine. And he is perfect, the perfect imprint of the very image of God's nature, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. When he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and radi- riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. So, you know, just this perfect stamped image of the glory of God walked around on earth for 33 or so years. But there's, some, there's a greater revelation to that than Jesus was here for 33 years. We have access to where he is today. There, there is a hope inside of us. And the hope is not hope to get you through your day, although that's what it does. The hope is there's another kingdom. There's another universe out there that we have access to right now. David had nothing compared to what we have because inside of us lives the Holy Spirit you didn't have to go to a location somewhere out in the middle of the Middle East to see God the problem is and I I don't have this in the notes but the problem is I've I've actually done a lot of research on the post apostate the, basically the guys that were around after the apostles you know the first two or three hundred years of the early church and most of them did not believe like a lot of the ancient Jews that God was at all visible in any way that you were not able to see him at all period Origen, Origen wrote a lot of what you believe today believe it or not he didn't believe that he's one of the guys he believed angels were these orbs that floated around he had an allegorical view of the Bible. A lot of us do. When we read verses like Ezekiel, when you read verses like Daniel, when you read verses like Revelation, in the back of your mind, thanks to Origen and his, his crew, he had a school in Alexandria, they have programmed us, in addition to Hollywood, to believe that angels are, you know, Casper the friendly ghost, translucent spirit creatures. That's not them at all. One of them killed 185,000 people. One. David, when he took the census, he saw an angel in between heaven and earth. Giant guy. Huge. And 
thank God he repented because it would have wiped everybody out. Just one. One. 185,000 people during Hezekiah. Killed them all. Wiped them all out. He's not a translucent spirit creature. It actually says that their heads were taken off. They were, you know, this, these guys are serious. So, yeah, what would you say? <laughs> They're real. If I could just say that, if I could just say that a hundred times right now and think that it, you guys, you know, that we would all just get it, like, I would, I would so do that. Um, but it takes time. It takes a lot of time reading the Bible. Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Can I see this? Can you show, can you make this real to me right now? That doesn't happen the first time you do it normally. I mean, if it, uh, praise God if it did. It usually happens after years of just, God, show me your glory in this verse. And then one day, one day, one day you just see it. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the, the hope of the glory that's in us. And I wanted to talk about what this whole glory thing's about. Romans 5, and, and I'll wrap it up in a little bit. Romans 5, he says, Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Through Him also we have our access, entrance, introduction by faith into this grace, state of God's favor in which we firmly and safely stand. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. Romans 5, 1 and 2. It's just amazing. Just hidden. I mean, just think about that for a second. He's not saying you might. He's not saying let's, let's you know, it'd be nice if. Let's rejoice and exalt in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. And you have access because of one word, faith. Faith is what says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this and I'm not going to stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat on the doors of heaven until God shows me his glory. That's what faith does. Colossians 1.5, because of the hope of experiencing what is laid up, reserved, and waiting for you in heaven of this hope you have heard in the past in the message of the truth of the gospel. It's reserved and waiting for you and laid up for you to experience heaven. Colossians 127, to whom God was pleased to make known how great for the Gentiles are the riches of his glory, this mystery which is Christ within you and among you, the hope of realizing the glory. Christ in us, Christ in me, the anointing, the Holy Spirit inside of me is that tugging on my heart that says one day you're going to experience glory. One day you're going to experience glory. Ephesians 2 6 says, And he raised us up together with him and made us to sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Ephesians 2 18, For it is through him that we both whether far off or near, now have an introduction, access by one Holy Spirit to the Father so that we are able to approach Him. What, what is where He is? The glory of God. The glory of God. And it doesn't say when you die, hopefully, eventually, it says now have an introduction, access by one Holy Spirit to the Father. 
Ephesians 3, Ephesians is just one of the most incredible books, letters. I mean, think, this guy just wrote a letter. This is what a letter looks like. There's really no reason to say that Paul isn't still writing about God today in heaven. I wonder what I wonder what he has I wonder what he would say. He says in whom because of our faith in him we dare to have the boldness the courage and confidence of free access and unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. See that the Jewish people had to fear the glory of God because at any moment God would be angry and wipe out your entire family. Not us. Not us. We've got two more verses. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor for us sinners that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need. Yeah, I love that little tag at the end. It says, appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. He's never late. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. Therefore, brethren, since... We have full freedom and confidence to enter into the holy of holies by the power and virtue and the blood of Jesus by this fresh, new, and living way which he initiated and dedicated and opened for us through the separating curtain veil of the holy of holies, that is, through his flesh. So I, I have been criticized, and that's okay, I mean, I get it, that I read a lot of verses. <laughs> People have said that to me that you know you read you read so much of the, so many verses. Preaching today is actually kind of um, it's different. It's not really preaching. I don't really have anything to say that's of any value, anyways. Um, and no one really does. All we do is we point to the Word of God. That's all we do. I, I mean, I think people would I think people would be amazed that some of these descriptions of God and of God's glory and people would just be amazed and then you turn to it in their Bible and they're just they look at you like you're you know has that always been there yeah yeah I'm gonna read one right now it's it's always been there it's not just certain versions you know let this just everybody just close your eyes we're just gonna read this we're just gonna let we're gonna let the glory of God just kind of rise in us right now Daniel 7 says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white like snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The courts were seated and the books were opened. Just this, this display. Just this display of God's glory. The courts are, the courts are set. Everything's in order. Everything's moving as it should. This beautiful, brilliant light surrounding this throne. This emerald bow, that's the, like the appearance of the glory of God. Fire consuming it. And as if planned for millions of years, the books that were prepared ahead of time were just opened. He says, I was watching in the night visions... And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. 
Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Just the glory, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. Just the glory of God. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the long commandments which I have written. And then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. He spent over a month in the glory. Over a month in the glory. The glory of the Lord just there the majesty of the glory of the Lord I'm just going to read I'm going to read another one and I looked and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim there appeared something like a sapphire stone having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And there he spoke to man clothed with white linen, said, Go in among the wheels under the cherub and fill your hands with coals of fire. Scatter them over the city. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple. And the house was filled with the cloud, And the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even in the outer court, like the voice of Almighty God when he speaks. It's in Ezekiel chapter 10. Just hidden, hidden away. Tucked in a book no one reads anymore. Revelation, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over the mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses. The hope of glory, the hope of glory that the Holy Spirit gives us is so that we can taste the goodness of God. We can taste, you can smell the anointing. Revelation 21, he says, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. It's not a make-believe mountain. This is a real high lofty mountain in heaven and he showed me the great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God her light was like a most precious stone like a jasper stone clear as crystal The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. You can almost see. And 
he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street and on either side of the river, the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding fruit in each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Just amazing. Hidden. So what, what does all of that mean? Well, the spirit that's going to be poured out, it comes with a price. And I wish I could tell you that it was, I wish I could just shout up here and say it's all going to work out and everything's going to be great. But the reality is, is you can see the glory of God at any moment. All you have to do is close your eyes and say, Lord, <laughs> kind of going through a hard time right now. Can you show me the glory of the Lord? One thing that I've been convinced of, I mean absolutely convinced of lately, is that we cannot make it without the Lord's help. And if you are, you're doing something wrong. If you can get through the day without saying, Father, I need your help. I need you to come and reveal your son to me. I need you to come and speak to me. I need you to pull me out of this. If you can get through your day without that, you're doing something wrong. We're not intended to live like that. We're intended to be completely dependent on the glory of God. Absolutely. There's no way around it. So I just, I wanted, um, I know it's getting there, and I wanted Jacob to come and play a little on the piano, and I wanted to just, you know, if you, if you uh, I'm just going to do a practical exercise. <laughs> We're going to experience the glory of the Lord. Because in actuality, it doesn't matter what notes he plays or what chords he plays, and it doesn't matter how well his voice is or not well or whatever. It, none of that matters. What matters is that our hearts are positioned to experience the supernatural positioned to experience the more of God, the glory of God. Glory is the most important thing on the planet. For his, he did it for his namesake. His love is an overflow of his glory. He wants us to display his glory. We're like mirrors. We reflect. We share we are a part of the glory of the Lord. You were created to display the glory of the Lord. That's why you were made. That is the reason he fashioned you. That's the reason he brought you into this earth. You are not a mistake. You are not a trick. You are not someone who has no purpose. Every single problem that you have stems from an incorrect view of your purpose. If you could just believe, if you could just get this as the centerpiece of your theology that you were created to display and radiate the glory of God, everything else would fit. He loves you with an everlasting love He's loved you from antiquity. He will love you into eternity. There is no end to the fountain of his love for you. And you can experience that love through the tangible presence 
of the glory of God. So we're just going to close our eyes. We're going to lift our hands. We're going to, whatever you need to do, get on your face, walk around, pace, get under a table. If you have to leave, I understand, but I just feel like this is something that I know we've been maybe missing. We're just going to make it for lost time. Father, I ask right now, Lord, you've given me authority as your son. You've given me authority as a priest and as a king. Through your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, in the name of your son, I ask, let your glory, let it fall right now. Father, let your glory come and heal. Let it destroy the bondages. Let it destroy the strongholds. Let it break through the barriers, the chains, the walls, the fortresses. And pierce the very hearts of every person in this room. Rebuild those ruins inside of us. Give us an understanding of our identity as sons and daughters. Of worshipers, of priests. Father, right now, just flow. Let your Holy Spirit just flow right now. Like David, Lord. Like Abraham, like Moses, like Jeremiah like Ezekiel, like Elijah, like Isaiah. Lord, we have one desire. We want to see you. We want to feel your presence. We want to stare into the eyes of eternity. We want to get caught up. We want to get taken up. Lord, we read so many verses and they all say one thing. We need your glory. I need your glory, Lord. just going to come and he's just going to touch you and he's going to he's going to put some pictures in your head of things that he wants you to let go don't be surprised if you see pictures or videos or little clips of things that he wants you to let go just let go just say God you're in control I don't want it He's going to, some of you, he's going to show things that you need to ask for forgiveness for, things you need to repent of. That's good. That is the way into the Father's heart. Death. Perfect humility. For some of you, he's going to show you things of the future, things that haven't happened yet. A loved one healed or brought to the Lord. Someone who has been afar off for a long time. You're going to see pictures of them running and leaping into the Father's arms. That's not just fluff. That's the Lord. He's trying to speak to you. He's trying to give you hope of glory. Some of you are going to see things from heaven. You're going to see fire. You're going to see lightning. It's different for everyone. God wants to speak. 
He wants to speak. He wants to speak. He wants to show you his love. He wants that. I don't have to ask him and beg him. He wants it. If you need to pray in tongues, if you need to pray in English, just let him move. Let him have free will. Let him do whatever he wants. Some of you are going to feel the sensation of rain or wind or fire. Don't worry about any of that. Just focus on God's glory. None of that other stuff really matters. It's His glory. But when He shows up, it's always supernatural. Lord, come and heal broken hearts. Lord, remind remind them of the dreams and the plans that you gave them as children. The visions that they had in the nighttime, the dreams, Lord God, that they had. Some of them have let that go. God, I just pray that you would restore that right now. Let them be like children, Lord. Lord, physical physical problems, chronic illnesses from them or family members. Lord, I just pray right now that you would just put a picture of a family member or a friend that has a chronic illness that you want to heal. Put it in their minds right now. And if God if God puts a picture in your head, just start praying for that person. Just say, Lord, go and visit them right now, wherever they are, heal them. You don't have to pray an eloquent or theologically sound prayer. Just pray whatever. He he won't put a picture in your mind of someone that he wants you to pray for as a joke. He's serious. Some of you are going to see things like being successful at your job, promotions, whatever. All that's great. It comes with being in right standing with the Lord. It comes with having his glory as absolutely first. He wants to raise you up. His his plan is to raise you up. Absolutely it is. But only if his glory is first. I feel like some of you might be seeing a picture of a river or stream or a lake. He just, he wants you to enjoy him. He just wants you to enjoy him. We've read the equivalent of probably a book in the Bible tonight. I feel like God has said a lot of things. I feel like he can, he wants to continue to say things. Don't worry about the, the beauty and the signs and the, the mystery. Don't worry about that. Just focus on Christ. Focus on Jesus. Focus on His Son. Focus on Him. So Lord, we just we ask you, God, in closing, Father, I just pray that you would come visit us at home, at work. Father, tonight I pray for a tranquil sleep, a good night's sleep. I pray for rest. Father, I ask you in the name of your Son for rest for every single person in this room right now. Father, I pray that you would restore the dreams and the visions, the desire for more, the hunger to read more of your word, the desire to evangelize and to witness. I pray that that would rise right now inside of every person in this room. Lord, I know you're not done yet. Father, thank you for what you've said tonight. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you will continue to do. Lord, I pray for Pastor Frank and Pastor Paris right now, wherever they are, just visit them. Let them encounter just a supernatural, unexpected touch of your presence right now.
son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, God's glory is available to you at any time. All you have to do is want it. That's it. And he's faithful. He'll never let you down, I promise. You will never, ever, ever be let down. So if you guys, uh, we're going to, um, I guess, do you mind just playing for a while? I mean, is that right? So if you want to stay and soak, you're welcome to. If you want to open your Bible and read something, you're welcome. It was kind of a special night. And, you know, if you need to go, if you have, uh, that's okay. There's no judgment. It's no big deal. If you want to stay and soak, Jacob is going to play. He's going to sing. And we'll just keep it open for a little while. And um, Jim, if you need to go, that's all right. I'll take care of the sound. No big deal. Um, you're welcome to just soak and saturate in his presence. Because for some of you, there's still something he wants to say.